There we go. But this will close these guys up. All right, here we go. You can make your family's life much brighter. You will find your work much lighter. It's as easy as can be to live better. Electrically, you can have more time for fun and pleasure. Family moments you will treasure. It's an opportunity to live better. Electrically. Modern folks have learned to save their time and energy too. You don't have to work and slave. Let electricity do it for you. You can have your cake and you can eat it. Make life sweet, it's hard to beat it. What a thrill to be so free when you live electrically. Woo! There we go. Getting on the choo-choo train of electrification. Exactly. That is so much fun. So welcome everybody. This is the Ask Sean Show, the second Ask Sean Show. Uh, hope everybody's doing well. We uh, are happy to see you all here tonight, and um, we have some. Th this whole this whole uh, session, this whole show, is about you. It's about living electrically. It's about all the individual questions you have. Uh, that you don't get answered when you listen to overview programs. Those are very important. They teach us. But this is all about getting your personal questions answered. And we've got the guy to do it. Sean Armstrong is here from Hello, Webwood everybody. Energy. And, um, and also Tristan, Tristan Miller. So uh, wait, before you go to that, Sean, uh, yeah. Tristan, did you want to... Uh, <laughs> talk about a few of the uh the news items that we have seen this week absolutely let me see if i can uh share my screen and okay. present at the same time all right here we go and let me click present thank you all for waiting i sean i think we have some amazing journeys that everybody's sharing in the chat um we just want to make sure that we share our bitly for the next show um, starting in August, it's going to be Bitly, the Ask Sean show. And um, we shared the video. And you know, your co hosts, along with Sean, Diana, and Tristan, um, it's a journey that we're on to electrification. So we thought, why not? Let's all do it together. And you're going to learn a lot. You're going to get some great case studies, some tips. You're going to be able to have your own questions answered, as well as we're going to focus on some new you know, things coming down the pike. Uh, obviously case studies every show. And if you're interested in sharing your case study or getting some free consulting on that, please email us. We'll share that in the chat. Um, last month, um, Wei Tai shared his personal electrification journey. And now that video is up on YouTube. So we'll put that link in the chat in case you missed the first show or wanna go back and get some more fantastic ideas from Sean. Um, also, this week, Sean shared a very cool news about a building in Seattle, 15 stories, 112 unit complex, that is one of the greenest buildings in Seattle. So um, a lot of exciting things going on. Here's a cool map that uh, Sean and all of his followers were sharing about how many homes are electrified in, um, in the United States. And, uh, you know, it's interesting, look at Hawaii and Florida crazy. Um, and California, we have some way to go. So that's why we're doing this show so we can help that along. One in four homes in the US are electric. A lot of them are in the South, which is really interesting. Um, and now it's time for Sean to take it away. So I'm going to stop sharing. And I'll put those links in the chat for you guys. Thank you so much, Diana. Thank you so much, Tristan. And let me get my slides up here. Hey, everybody. I'm going to put so it to the chat too if you would like to submit a case study for next time. Uh, just what, what you need to do. We'll post that a few times. Thank I you. I very time. much appreciate that. I'd love it if you guys could send us any emails of pictures in advance and I'll, I'll put more effort into your particular house. If you, um, if you put a little effort into it, I will put a little effort into you and, and it can work out that way. So, okay, so this is a QA show. I'm going to give just like a few minutes of slides. And then we're going to do Q&A. That's the goal of the, of the thing for you guys to ask questions. And we'll try to get as much done today as we can. 
Um, my background is I got trained in this in college in electrification of buildings in 1995 to 2000 um, at Humboldt State, now Cal Poly Humboldt. And I've done a lot of projects, um, more than 10,000 residences now, all electric. So um, I focused on con new construction and retrofits and all of it. Now, the quick little background. This has happened before. In the 1930s, only one in 10 homes in the countryside had electricity at all. And nine in 10 homes in the city did. And so from 1934 slash 35 um, to 19, approximately 63, there was an official large program funded by the federal government called the Rural Electrification Administration and beautiful posters from the era. And then in the 1950s, this happened again is where the utilities like they are now are catching on to the fact that all electric will be the future. At the time, they thought they were gonna have nuclear power plants to provide clean energy. And they got going pretty hard until the Three Mile Island accident where we realized that maybe it wasn't clean enough. But up until that point, 1900 utilities were chipping in on the number to one television show in the country, number one, on Sunday nights, the General Electric Theater. So we could do this again, as you think big. I wanna give you a sense of where it's happening. It started in Europe. In 2011, it was when Zurich, uh, Switzerland, was the first one to ban gas in new construction and started requiring retrofits in 2016. And I didn't know about that until um, Amsterdam had banned it in 2016, the first time I heard about it, which was uh, the impetus behind organizing around the Berkeley gas ban and all the ones that have come since then. But so this is an international movement and also all across the country. I'm just showing California, but New York and Colorado, uh, Massachusetts, Washington State, Hawaii, a lot of other places have great policies. And to point out that um, the Bay Area Air Quality Management District has said they're gonna ban the sale of all gas appliances for retrofits included in 2027. Carver said that will happen in 2030 for the state. So soon come. We wanted to point out that you're not weird. The whole country has been moving towards all electric construction since, well, since 1900, but we took a 20 year break from 1973 to 93. After 93, what you're seeing here, this is a map of the growth of electricity meeting hot water and space heating needs in homes in yellow. That's everywhere. It's been happening since 1993, long before any sort of effort or program per se. It's just that it's less expensive to build that way. This you already saw, but it's so exciting um, to see that like Hawaii is at 72% or Florida is at 77%. Now Florida only has 3% of its grid is solar. That's including, it's only the, the utility. I'm not clear what its rooftop solar is. It's frequently excluded from stats, even though in California for years, rooftop solar was significantly more than utility solar. That started to flip in the mid 2015 era kind of thing. But for a long time, we the people were putting the solar on the grid much faster than hostile utilities were. So Florida, they have a dirty grid and clean appliances. And they're like the inverse of California where only 8% of our construction is all electric. But our grid is much cleaner, we're at like 60 something percent decarbonized. This is a map saying everywhere in the country, putting in heat pumps is a decarbonization move. Even in Governor Manchin, boo, I mean, Senator Manchin, piss. Even Manchin's state of West Virginia, that's a place to put in heat pumps. Even with their like 92% coal grid, it's still a decarbonization move because heat pumps collect energy from the environment. Okay, so almost everything we're gonna talk about is in this book, a pocket guide to all electric retrofits of single family homes. It's a free download on our website at redwoodenergy.net. So I'm gonna go through stuff. If you don't catch it because it's going kind of fast, you can slow down with the book, get out a hot cocoa and you know, some reading glasses and enjoy yourself a nice picture oriented book. Now, starting off with Larry. Larry, are you there? I saw you show up. I just wanna make sure I got you your attention here. Yes. You got me. All right, Mr. Kramer. Yes, <laughs> I recognize the picture. <laughs> Thank you for sending it. So here you can see your yellow gas line entering your water heater. And here is your dirty pollution vent right there, where if the wind blows too hard, it can poison you in your house because it can back that in. So your water heater, I'm looking over at the, you took a nice picture. And I can see there's a 40,000 BTU per hour, which is a standard amount of, of water heating gas burning. 
going on. 40,000 BTU is just a standard gas water heater. And you, you replace that with a, not 40,000, but about max 4,000 heat pump water heater. This is a different thing, right? It looks the same. It's a tank that sits over in the corner with earthquake strapping holding it in. But these tanks, these are heat pumps with electric resistance backup to greater or lesser degree. So Stiebel Eltron, the best, the premier of our heat pump water heaters in the country, uh, started construction in 1985. It's made by the best, I mean, it's made by the number one um, water heating company in Germany, Stiebel Eltron. And uh, Stiebel's grandson came to college in the hippie days in the 1970s, I was, when I was born and proudly raised by hippies. Um, so he came to the United States or Vermont and he stayed and he um, brought German engineering quality and high performance to America. And in 1985, started making these fantastic heat pump water heaters, the Accelera, but they're like $2,500 for the same amount of, of water heater that you get for a Rheem or an A.O. Smith. So these ones are like $1,600 heat pump water heaters, $1,500 for like a 40, 50 gallon tank, which is what you have a 40 gallon tank. I was looking at this, sorry, you have a 50 gallon tank. <laughs> My bad, 50 gallon tank. Um, so you'd put in a 50 gallon A.O. Smith or Rheem or Stiebel Eltron. Stiebel Eltron, by the way, only comes in 58 gallons as its smallest because that extra eight gallons represents a whole shower of hot water. And they um, wanted to have their smallest tank that they sold be a very satisfying, even for a large household. So Larry, I was wondering how, how many people in your family um, bathe in your house? How many bathe there, are just, your house? there are just two of us. Okay, so just the two of you would need no more than a 40 gallon. You could actually downsize if you wanted to save a little bit of money, like $300 or something on buying a water heater, which is frequently tripled in the final sale cost to you is how all the markups work. So you could get a 40 gallon, but only Ream sells a 40 gallon heat pump water heater. So that's what you do is you, you could get a 40 gallon. That's the smallest one. And for two people, that's all you need. Uh, 50 gallons, of course, come in Ream and A.O. Smith and Bradford White. And Ream and A.O. Smith are considered the kind of the middle brand. You know, there's like cold oatmeal, warm oatmeal, and hot oatmeal kind of thing. Um, I guess Ream's and A.O. Smith said the just right, like their price point is good. A lot of manufacturers and big developers use them. And Stiebel Eltron's a little bit more of a niche, high-end uh, heat pump water heater, you know, German. And Bradford White is a little more of like just sort of the American get her done. <laughs> the warranty is a little bit shorter, that kind of thing. Um, and it's usually a little bit less expensive. So that's the first thing, that's your options. Those are the brands. Um, I'm not mentioning this Eco2 over on the side because that is a Japanese sitting tub heat pump water heater. That's enough hot water for like eight apartments, eight households. And you could have it for your house if you had a 150 gallon sitting tub. I should ask that. Um, what's the biggest volume of water that you fill, Larry? <laughs> Do you take big baths? Larry, if you're still- No, no, I, I'm, uh, I take Navy showers. My wife takes a little bit longer one than I do. Right, longer hair probably. Yeah. Yep. Um, my partner, he takes Navy showers for like four minutes tops and his wife takes literally a 20 minute shower. <laughs> that's about right. Yeah, you know, that's how, that's how it goes. So um, neither of those two habits require a Japanese sitting tub. Um, that is, yeah, so you don't have to talk about the Eco too. So um, now the next thing to talk about with you, Larry, is it, your panel. Yeah. Class. Ream, as an example, they offer three different types of water heater. They offer, say, like, you know, your 40 gallon tank that I'm suggesting is all you really need. Your 40 gallon tank um, comes in a 30 amp model and 30 times 240, that's 7,200 technically watts on the panel. In the real world, it's about a, a 
5,000 watt. But anyway, so they offer a 5,000 watt heat pump water here. That's their, their primo uh, tons of electricity, electric resistance backup. It, it uses more energy, by the way, by about a third of the, compared to. Um, there's the 2,200, so 2,200 versus 5,000 watt. There's the 2,200 watt one. And now Reem is selling a 900 watt one. All three of those have the same heat pump, but they have different amounts of electric resistance, which is like a toaster element. They have different amounts of toaster element inside of them. Why do you have a toaster element, you may ask? Well, if you have it located so it's pulling cold outside air in the winter time, and you take a bunch of showers, then you might wanna have electric resistance to help make hot water in a pinch, because you might run out of hot water and the heat pump can't, it produces half as much heat in the winter in the depths of winter, like December, as it would in the peak of summer, like now. So half as much heat for the same amount of electricity and effort. So it takes twice as long. So you can just run out of hot water. So some people, if they have sort of an extreme circumstances, they want the 30 amp, 5,000 watt model. And I recommend people more towards the 2,200 watt model or the 900 watt model. The 900 watt one, that plugs into any outlet nearby. You don't have to rewire a 240 volt circuit over like you would for the other two, but because they have electric resistance, that's that 240 volt. So the easiest thing you could do would be to get a ream, retrofit ready, heat pump water heater, the 900 watt one, 120 volt, 900 watts, which I have in my own house and it definitely fills a 50 gallon bathtub. So there's no, like, it's not like it's not enough. <laughs> it's just, um, yeah. So, how much is that, Sean? How much is the range for that ring? So how much does it cost, you mean? Yes. Well, here we have data from about 1,650 installations in SMUD territory, all of them retrofits, gas to electric of 50 gallon tanks. So, the orange bold line here is the average over the course of two years. And they thought, well, maybe the average is going up because we have such a healthy incentive of $3,000. Maybe we should lower it to 2,500, which they did at this black dotted line. And they're like, well, maybe the price went down because basically they were worried that the companies were charging more because the incentive was so healthy that they could make more money and still have people buy it. But nonetheless, the real world is that they cost $3,500 to $4,500 to install. Now, the, in darker orange, that's one standard deviation, which captures like 80 something percent. So note that the lower costs might have been almost $1,000 less. So one standard deviation, it was like $2,500 to $3,500, but also one standard deviation above. So it's like 40% below, 40% above in that darker pink. It was also $4,500 to $5,500. So this is the difference between getting one bid and three bids. And this is the difference between having a challenging installation versus a relatively straightforward. Okay, so three bids means you will get variation in pricing. There is no way that you're gonna get three bids that are the same price. You will get a low and medium and a high. And they are frequently significantly different numbers because the high contractors coming in saying, I'm amazing and I deserve it. Or they're coming in saying, I don't really care. I just want to get these jobs. I'm so busy that I'll just throw a number at this. And if they say yes, then great. And if no, there's some more fish in the sea. So you get like high cost folks or people who are scared, who don't know what they're doing and decide to upcharge because ne they've never done it before. And that's where you get the variation. Um, this pricing here, it says $1,100, $1,300. The pricing has gone up significantly because of um, the COVID, mostly microchip shorts, but everything, right? So now they're like $1,500, $1,700 for the exact same water heater, just so you know. And, um, oh, and operationally, if you're in Sacramento, this would be very similar to what you'd see. You'd see a significant decline in your bill if you went to a heat pump water heater versus the best gas water heater you could buy. The best it would be the lowest you get is $231. But if you live in pg &E territory, these numbers are probably almost the exact same. It might be a little bit more for the heat pump or it might be a little bit less for the heat pump. And that'd be true in 
San Diego and, and LA, it'd be kind of an up or down, depending upon if you put the heat pump water heater in your house, it's more efficient than if you put it in outside because it draws cold air from outside. So, you know, the bills can go up or down depending. Now, Larry, just to make sure I took care of you before I start taking other questions, what questions do you have about this feedback I just gave you? Well, my concern is that I took a picture of my panel, my electric panel, and it looks to me like I'm maxed out on that. And okay. I don't know how I would hook this one up to get electricity to it. Now that's the trick is that you get the ream tank. I spent some time on that to make sure you knew that option, the 900 watt one. So the 900 watt tank, that's, just, that's the one you're going to use. Let's just assume that now. Moving forward, we understand it looks exactly like this. No difference in its appearance. What it does is it, it doesn't, it doesn't have is electric resistance backup. So it has what's called mixing valves in it because it stores water as opposed to having backup. It has a backup of hot water, differently put. So you can store this tank at 130 degrees Fahrenheit, which is totally safe, no worries. You, you touch that water, it feels like hot water. Or at 140 degrees Fahrenheit, which is hot, and would scald your skin and make it peel off you within like 30 seconds or less of running at 40, 140, hurt you, too hot but it has mixing valves in it, so it only delivers 120 degree Fahrenheit. So they're built in and it can't, go me it can't mess that up. So it's totally safe to have it have a hot water storage as opposed to electric resistance backup. We've studied this in 23 apartments, including seven person households from seven, six, five, all the way down. And we found that tenants got better service if they stored hot water than if they had the 30 amp, the 5,000 watt, um, 5,000 watt version, the high electric resistance mode, that provided worse service. Electric resistance is not as good as more hot water at giving you long, like shower after shower after shower kind of stuff. So just you and your partner, you, you will, you know, it just won't happen. <laughs> you, you, will, you will not run out of hot water. It would take you almost an hour of standing in the shower before you notice the temperature change. Well, fantastic. And, and that's plenty. So yeah. The, um, I'm gonna put it over here in the chat. The, the, you want, you want, Larry, is the ream. Um, so ream 120 volt, I call it retrofit ready um, water heater. And you can, they're coming out right now, this month, I've been sort of working along. So I think that if you pester your plumbing company or something like that, saying this is what I want, I know that Reem's coming out with them, go get it for me, please. Um, and there, we do have resources, the switcheson.org yeah. that also can hook you up with different contractors. Um, and uh, Diana can put another guest that we had on another webinar for you to check out too. But let's get to some of the other questions in the chat because everybody's been, is, had put some really great things that I wanna know the answers to as well. Okay, I'll start off at the start to sort of be polite. So Gary, you want to implement a whole house disconnect for bi-directional EV chargers. And you may or may not know that Asiaco is the only Asiaco is the only brand right now that's available for vehicle to building chargers. But let's see here if I got it, my slide. I have all this other stuff to talk about if people have questions about it. Here. So on this slide here, you can see on the lower left-hand corner, right-hand corner, pardon me, it goes wall box, the quasar. That's been promised for a couple of years. That's out of Spain. And then there's Asiaco, the decibel, and they're just starting to pilot that out of Canada in the United States. And that's John Sarter is the person you're looking for. He's here in San Francisco. And I, Nuve, they're already offering that for buses but they haven't brought out their um, residential model yet, but they're about to. So those are the people I know of that are, are bringing that in. So I think that's, the, you need a, I mean, a disconnect is just a little piece of, of metal, but you need something like this. You know, this is a uh, wall box, by the way, that's just an EV vehicle to building charger. Whereas Asiaco is also a solar inverter and a power manager in your house. So it, it has more tricks up its sleeve. Um, I've got my. We should do, Sean. We should do a gift guide to electrify your house. 
<laughs> and put it together in the fall and share it with everybody. Say, this is what I want. <laughs> That's a really good idea. It's just to make a plan for yourself, of course. So um, then Kate, Kate Unger, um, you said you want to do it all. Storage, EV and charging, the heat pump, water heaters, the space heating and dryers. You need one or more good contractors who won't charge an arm and a leg and you're in Glendale. And I responded saying, the switch is on campaign. You saw that slide that I had on the heat pump water heater pricing, you know, the standard deviation, standard deviations and such. That company that produced it is called Efficiency First California, a nonprofit that's dedicated to the building industry of high performance homes. Like we're, I'm on the board, we're sort of labor advocates of sort, but we got hired to manage SMUD's program. And this, this, uh, our database that started just in SMUD territory has grown to the whole state because of um, tech rebates that are for retrofits, electrification retrofits. And so we got like 750 contractors that we've done at least two personal interviews of like, we call them up at least two people who call up and confirm that they are a good contractor. We also look at their Yelp reviews and their Google reviews to make sure that there aren't any red flags through them and they have at least two stars or above. <laughs> um, and uh, we try to we try to vet the people basically so that this this database of people who are willing to come to your house and do one two three or four of those things and have done it um that's there so the switch is on their, their database of contractors i think is the the best thing that we have in the state it's not yeah. equally good across the state because it's obviously very heavy in smud territory <laughs> but yeah. um, it has grown quite a bit and i put the link in the chat thank you so much um so uh, again, you went on to say, Kate, thanks, Sean, three bids from who? And like you said, you got to from that database. But here, think about it this. Most of the cost, about three fourths of the cost of your electrification is likely going to be your HVAC system, your heating and cooling system. From my experience, it means like it's $15,000. In fact, I can actually show you some pricing here. There. Look at this slide. You, you want to get a hold of the person who does the blue part. That's the HVAC. That's most of it. This gray part, this is being done in Michigan, or sorry, in Ohio. And this is the insulation that people are putting into their homes to make them more comfortable because they've got a budget. These are all people who had money in their pocket, except a couple of people like the 10,000 and the 17,000, they didn't get any insulation. <laughs> but other people who want their house to be more comfortable, um, they did. You're not gonna have such a big deal with that in California. So you wanna get a hold of the people who do the blue work, which is the HVAC and get three bids from them. The second person you're getting bids from is the yellow part, the water heaters, which is relatively small. It's like a third or a fourth as expensive as the HVAC. So yeah, you wanna get a couple of bids from your, your plumber too, but you definitely wanna call up three different companies that do air conditioning because air conditioners are our heat pumps. They're the same thing. So when you call up an air conditioner company and say, I'd like you to put in a heat pump, please, they know what they're doing. They might try to talk you out of it because they're used to working with gas in California because you know we're not Hawaii, we're not Florida, even though we have a very similar climate. Um, we just don't have a lot of people who are experienced putting in heat pumps versus it being completely standard or the normal. So if you just get around them talking you out of it or go to that database, right? Um, switches on, those are all people who are into it. Um, that's how you do it. So you really only have two people, you have to, two things to deal with. Your HVAC, which is the most important heating and cooling system. The second is your plumbing. And then it's just your stove and your, your laundry dryer. And um, those are just appliances, not a big deal. Just get, get an electrician there. Okay, now Robin, you said Robin Gilbert from San Fernando Valley. We are getting solar panels within one month. What is the most beneficial way we can use our utilities? I think you like use your solar energy. I'm not quite clear what you mean, I guess. When you say use your utilities, you mean, might mean like use them during the day. <laughs> use them when the solar panels are making electricity because that's the most decarbonized electricity that's available, period. 100% solar offset is when your own panels are making electricity versus some dirty mix from the grid. But during the day when you're making it yourself, um, is the way to do it and then avoid it at night because that's the dirtiest at the moment at least. And Tom Cabot says, hi, I'm from Menlo Park. I'm interested in how we can simplify, speed up and scale retrofit electrification. 
Tom, my good buddy. Thank you for that softball. So um, let me show you how to scale up fast. So there, there was a whole bunch of money given to Menlo Park through some state legislation. Tom and Diane Bailey on here are helpfully partly responsible. And so I'm advocating that they use this. This, when I mentioned how HVAC is three fourths of the cost, it's because 10,000 BTUs, this product puts out 10,000 BTUs per hour. And that's like 10,000 matches in your hand burning. That's, that's that amount of heat. Ouch, the whole thing from tip to tip, 10,000 of those is what this can do in an hour of heating or cooling in reverse. Take the 10,000 matches out of your house. But this is the only one that has an inverter, which is a computer that makes it quiet and has, gives it essentially the equivalent of an accelerator pedal. Like if you had a car that could only turn on and go 70 miles an hour or off, and you had to control that thing through a school zone, which is what it means when you don't actually, like it's a cool spring day and you're just trying to have a little bit of heat. Well, most heat pumps, the old fashioned types without the computers could only turn on or off. And so they do that over and over, over the course of an hour to sort of stop and start your way through the school zone until you know, full blast day in the summer, which is noisy and inefficient. This is the one cheap $600 powerful heat pump that's quiet that I have, my staff has, you know, we've been testing them out. Care over here is the second best and it's four times as noisy when it's at low speed and it's way less efficient. And so it's just there to point out they exist and don't even touch anything else. Just get the Medeo Duo, <laughs> just do that. Just, and stop there. <laughs> but that'd be the fastest way. You put two or three of those in a house and that's the entire home's heating and cooling. You could get it done under $2,000 instead of 15 to 25,000. And it's about 50% of the gas load in the house, 40 to 50% of all the gas being used in residences is that heating furnace thing. So that's the fast way. Second fastest. If most homes in California have something like this, they've got a, an air conditioner outside, about 70, 80% of homes have an air conditioner. Most of them are these blocks outside. These are heat pumps only going and not reversible, so they don't do heating. They're just single, single direction air conditioning. And then there's a box called a fan coil um, that is somewhere underneath the house, uh, maybe in a drop ceiling, but usually up in the attic. And that thing, you can just replace those devices, the box outside and the box inside, call it box swapping, and then leave the ductwork in place because that's another $8,000. So box swapping, if you just leave the ductwork in place, even though it might be inefficient, you can go there and you can tape the leaks, but getting into attics is expensive and dangerous because they're full of mouse poop. They frequently have asbestos piping left over if they're from the 50s, 60s, or 70s. They're hot as hell in the summertime and people die up there from like heat stroke trying to get work done in attics. So I've come to understand that insulating attics, which used to be like a great idea, it has some nuance to it, but you can electrify the heating and cooling system while leaving the insulation alone or improving insulation. Either one, go for it. So box swapping, just replace the gas thing with the same size, and equivalent of like everything about it, more or less the same, that's, that's the air conditioner version. And that's very technically feasible and more affordable than, like here's an example of what not to do if you're trying to save money. Don't think to yourself, you know, I always wanted a warm floor. I think when I'm electrifying, I'm gonna change my heating system from a gas furnace to a water source, you know, like an air to water heat pump, and I'm gonna do hydronic floors. So if you're gonna do that, <clears throat> more power to you, but your budget is not 15,000, it's 45,000 or 50 or 60. So just, you know, that's to Tom's question, how do you scale, go quickly? You usually don't change the heat distribution system, or if you do, you do it in a way that lowers the cost, not raises the cost. <laughs> Great. Um, yeah. Are you ready for another question? I so am. Well, I was looking at Sam's, that she's from Burbank. Hey. Um, and she says, I live in a uh, quadplex managed by a landlady who's not keen on upgrading. Any thoughts on the best ways to help change her mind? Not sure if it's possible, but uh, maybe Sam wants to elaborate a little bit. 
on that? Um, sure. She's, I think, <laughs> so long story short, we're, like I mentioned, it's a quadplex. Um, I don't think she, she seeks to not spend money wherever possible. Um, and she, I think the, the, what encapsulates her spirit is on Earth Day, she sent us all a mass email and said that we couldn't have EVs in our garage because they all lit on fire. So that's what I'm working with here. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> oh. Oh, okay. So, pretty so, tough, but uh all right. come to the so, right place. This sweetie. All right. Um a, a, a corollary story. When I started work at this development company in 2005, I'd walk down the hallway and I'd listen to hate radio on both sides, Rush Limbaugh on one and Mike Savage on the other, and all the way down, they're just like raging at me while I'm wearing my skirt to work. You know, while I'm just being my kind of gender queer self and just having this feeling, oh, this is gonna be such a hard place to get green building done because you're starting off with someone who's almost irrationally hostile. You know, they're not even just like normal, like it only works if it makes money. They're like, I kind of hate what you're even talking about. I'm gonna bring up some silly thing, like all the cars blow up. How many Halloween movies have we seen where a car blows up? It's like a most classic cliche trope, cars blow up. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's like, it, so electric cars, no more or less, nonetheless. So this is an example of what you could do, Sam, to get around this hostile, unwilling person is that you could just start, if you have windows that go up and down, this is a solution. And you could do this and it's actually pleasant because it's quiet and it heats and cools. And you'd have air conditioning and heating, and that's something that you could do. And I found that my, my, um, my employer, when I spent, after I'd worked there for three years and they'd gotten over our cultural differences, um, I brought him over to my home, my boss, and I showed him my window, my heat pump that I'd just put in like a year earlier. And he, was, he realized like, oh, it works and it's pleasant. And, and then we started a business and that's all we did. But getting him exposed was one of the steps. So maybe if you set up your home as a little bit of a demonstration of like this very low cost way to put in air conditioning. Do you have air conditioning, Sam, currently? Yes, thankfully we have air conditioning. It's it's a little spotty. Um, they had to, <laughs> she chose to have Freon, a, repl a Freon replacement instead of getting a new one. So, and it's, yeah. So I think that this, um, right. this replacement seems seems doable. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. We have 600 bucks that you could do instead of having a fight with your landlord. Now, um, you don't have this type, right? This isn't there. This is not the air conditioning or the heating. Um, no, it's central air. I think we have central air. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. so I think that- well, Let's invite you know, the rest of your tenants to join us. <laughs> now, for what do you, how do you dry your laundry? Standard. Um, just a standard dryer. I'm pretty sure that there is a conventional gas pump. So the, the, or the gas heater is in the same room as is in the laundry room. So. Okay. Do you, I'm sure you think it's probably a gas dryer? Uh, probably. Yeah. Yeah. They're like three fourths in California gas dryers, which is almost the reverse for the rest of the country, by the way, we are so bad. <laughs> California, <laughs> we're the worst. Okay. <laughs> So um, this is mine. I love this machine. And you consider this, this is a washer and a dryer. And this is how the rest of the world does their laundry. And almost nobody makes machines like Americans do where we have a separate machine for one and the other. Almost everybody has one machine. So LG has brought their Primo because LG is like the best appliance maker arguably right now. And um, this, this one here, the $1,700 one, I love it. First of all, it is a, a super high spin cycle if you want it to be. So it can get like 13, 14 RPM. So it makes it very dry for line drawing. If you're just trying to line dry, it's like super dry when it comes out, just spun. And then it also does the laundry dryer and it doesn't have a vent. So you don't need to retrofit. Like you can just plug this in. It's a 120 volt outlet. You just need to have it next to like, you know, the washing machine is because it, it's, you take out the washer and the dryer and you just put this thing there. <laughs> and so it goes into where the water goes and such. I bring this up because this is a way to get rid of your gas dryer and get a superior washing machine probably than what you have right now. And I'll say to everyone, like no one's expecting anyone to do this today, all of it at once, unless you can, 
you know, but like other than that, we're just like when it's time, when you can, then you this is one of the choices of a way to get rid of your gas dryers to go to um a condensing washer dryer. And they also make heat pump dryers that are um 120 volt like this, so you can plug it into any outlet, but they're not very common. Um so now this is another thing. Oh Sam, do you have a gas stove? We do have a gas stove. Ugh. When you say we, how many people are inhaling cigarette smoke off this stove? Oh, uh, just just me and my partner. So we we are not super big on induction cooking. I would love to have an induction stove. Um, and I think that there's still a little bit of a transition between like, you know, oh, an induction stove cooks just as well, if not better and doesn't poison you. <laughs> That's that thing. I'm with like, you. I was you know. there too. It's just as bad as cigarette smoke. Like, you know, how would you feel if your partner sat in the living room smoking cigarettes all day? Is that like an acceptable housemate behavior for you? No. <laughs> <laughs> because all of the studies since 1995 say that gas stoves are just as health unhealthy as the secondhand cigarette smoke in your house. It's because they put out a lot of combustion pollution. Like a cigarette's a small little burning thing. A gas stove is like 6,000 to 8,000 BTUs all at once. And you cook about 45 minutes, somewhere between 15 minutes and 45 minutes a day on average, except on like Christmas and Thanksgiving. And then people should freaking evacuate their homes. I mean, they're dying, they're killing themselves in your homes. The nitrogen dioxide and PM 2.5 levels are through the roof. It's worse than like standing in front of a car and inhaling the exhaust straight into your nose. <laughs> it's, it's only because you can't smell it. Yeah. It's the only reason why people aren't freaking out about how dirty it is. <laughs> because, so the, the way that I transitioned off my beloved antique gas stove that we literally dragged out of a field and dented the car getting it in, all of the sad things, we loved this thing because it had, we. We'd, you know, we'd upset the in-laws. We'd done everything. <laughs> we were committed to it. And I had little kids who had been born premature, likely, not joking, likely because we were using the gas stove to heat our studio apartment because we didn't have control over our own heat. And that is what gas stoves do. They cause premature birth. And we had twins, so we we're already vulnerable <clears> to <throat> it. So shit went down. And I, if I'd known, <laughs> I would have <laughs> changed my life. But instead, years later, when I finally learned how bad they were, I got one of these, which is like a two burner. And there's a whole bunch of them. They're not, they're kind of cheap. I mean, in all senses of the word. I, but I, I put them into my tiny house rentals because I have two. I live in one of them now. I'm an, I have an ex, so I, lived in, I moved into our tiny house, which I love. Um, and I, I cook on a $130 drink pod, true induction, because I like that one because it's the quietest fan. I'm kind of acoustically sensitive. And, and if I was less acoustically sensitive, I would probably get the um, Euro Dib. <clears throat> and Euro Dib is like 350 bucks instead of 130, but it's got all the computers in it so that you're always maximizing the possible cooking you can do with 1800 watts. And it's like the, the best of the controls, a little bit noisier fan. Anyway, I just, I happened upon Euro Dib coincidentally. I mean, I looked hard for a good one. I got it, the first one, and I loved it. I put it next to my gas stove and I quickly realized I didn't like my gas stove as much as I liked induction because I couldn't boil water as fast. And it was not as safe, like the gas stove, I, I really felt like it wasn't safe for the kids, even before I realized that they were just like sticking their nose into a cigarette. But before that, I just don't want them to get burnt. Um, I'd watched my mom catch on fire as a child. Her, her bathrobe caught on fire from the gas flame, the propane flame in our farmhouse. And she had to like throw this ball of fire off her body and run out of the kitchen, which was such an impression upon me about how dangerous flames are that I always wanted to keep the kids away. <laughs> and so this is, um, dude, we all have 200 bucks. I mean, don't we? So, yeah, I love it. I've switched too. And I was like you, Sam, where I was, you know, had the gas stove and I was not aware my oldest was born prematurely and um, I just have switched I've never gone back I mean I haven't even switched out my gas stove but I want to disconnect it because I don't want even the leak to be going on but it yeah. is a simple thing um, and it cooks great I mean my my kids are like mom everything's so much better what did you do and I was like induction 
<laughs> Same. I, I love it. It just took a little bit of a transition. You have to buy a few extra pots if you're if you don't already have those that work with them, but that's not a big deal. And it just just makes everything so much easier. So I'm going to go on to the next question here. I thank you, Tristan and Diana, for shipping in. So Catherine, it looks like you got a question. Catherine, you say, oh, there you are. Hello. Um, you asked, how do you tell if you have enough available on your panel for an induction range and a heat pump water heater? I have a 200 amp panel, which is the answer. That is more than enough. You have an embarrassment of riches of power. You, you could run a, a, most of an apartment complex if you tried hard. <laughs> um, you have a 200 amp panel. Is it difficult for an electrician to switch things around to free up some circuits? Um, you have lots of available circuits with your 200 amp panel. Like if, unless you were running an electric resistance hot tub that would take up 60 amps and you had already like a DC level two charger from, you would have so much difficulty using up a 200 amp panel. So you probably are just fine now. But do I, I do you? have um, an electric car. Okay. Do you have, but you don't have a, an electric resistance hot tub? No. <laughs> All right. You're good. Okay. okay. Good. Did you have any reason to think that you weren't good? Well, when I look at my circuits, I see there's something on every circuit. I don't see a circuit that's just sitting there waiting to be used. Okay. But I think it's not very well organized. Like some circuits have too much and some circuits don't have very much at all. So that is likely true and it's possible. What happens here is you could have gotten a 200 amp service and you could see a little 200 amp circuit there thicker but the, the number of circuit breakers down there might not add up to 200 and therefore you have you could put in a larger panel with just more slots to accomplish it they also make miniature breakers so you can go into an existing panel and just have smaller pieces of plastic with smaller controls okay. little mini ones in there yeah um and yes, sometimes electricians just sort of get kind of extravagant and they give everything its own circuit, right. so it doesn't need it. Right. I think there's only one thing, the electric resistance dryer that is code mandated to have its own circuit. And that's pretty much it, it's the only appliance. And there's like two circuits in the kitchen that are required and one in the bathroom that just have to be their own circuits there. But that's that's it, and everything else is kind of optional. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. That's yeah. great. You're, it sounds like you're good. You got your room. Just need to have an electrician um, help you out. And by all means, if anybody wants to be a case study for a future show, just email us. Yeah. Um, Diana and I both put the info in the chat. And um, there was a question earlier from Jocelyn from Huntington Beach. I don't know if you saw that one. Um, could you read it out loud? Yeah, it says, thanks, Sean. I would love to replace our water heater and oven stove top. So we've kind of covered some of it, but we could get to the stove top. And I just heard from a friend about rooftop water heating. Do you recommend that? So no. we'll go first go to the oven stove top first. Okay, so um, the pictures that I had ready were all slide-ins but there are tons of countertop ranges that don't have the oven underneath them. But I just didn't put in a picture of it. I apologize. I have a really cute one that shows Taylor Swift dancing in front of hers that I, oh. I grabbed. Next show, time. next show, we'll do it. Next show. So for the slide-ins, what you're seeing here on the top is that these are, are popular. These are glass top radiant. So this is an electric resistance, not as fast, not as immediate controllable, but safe-er and easy to clean. Then the slide-in inductions, they started about a thousand bucks from Frigidaire, that's the cheapest brand. And you know, cheap is, always comes with a little bit of issues. So get your warranty. Um, but then LG and Frigidaire and you know, makes a nicer one and Samsung and GE and such. So um, there's tons of, of brands out there. Um, on rooftop, the, when you're putting a water heater up on the roof, um, there's just a lot of issues actually, but mostly what it is is the solar thermal, the idea is that you're, you're putting up a solar thermal collector and there might be a box around that tank that makes like a little mini greenhouse to heat up the water. And those systems can be awesome and cheap and like inexpensive, I should say, 
and offset 30 to 70 percent of your hot water demand in a year but they almost always pair with gas water heaters and they don't play nice with heat pump water heaters because heat pump water heaters don't like to see hot water they they only work well with cold water coming in if they see hot water they start just shutting off and turning into electric resistance heaters and it confuses them so it's actually um and they also just operate very inefficiently so you you don't put a solar thermal collector upstream, so to speak, of a heat pump water heater. That is a no-no in design. And a heat pump water heater is fairly, is a solar thermal collector. To understand, let me get the picture of one of them up there. Oh, here, this nice. You can sort of see the, the device. This is a little air conditioner up here. <clears throat> and what it's doing is it's pulling sun warmed air through it. And there's a liquid inside that boils at negative 50 Fahrenheit. Well, in this case, negative 35 Fahrenheit for this refrigerant. But it boils at this crazy low temperature of negative 35 Fahrenheit. So it can always absorb heat from the air that's coming through, provided it has ways of defrosting itself in cold weather. But it certainly can absorb heat from the air, the sun-warmed air. So this is a solar thermal collector. It just does a much better job than ones on the roof because the ones on the roof don't boil. And they don't boil at a very low temperature, even if they did boil. They're just not at all a refrigerant that's designed to be super absorbent of heat. Super absorbent. So if you put an inefficient, expensive, difficult to install solar thermal collector up on the roof and then set, send hot liquid down, to go into this water heater, which destroys its efficiency. <laughs> you spent so much money to make the most inefficient system. <laughs> um, you might spend like $15,000 and get almost nothing out of it at the end of the day. Uh, I mean, you'd get, you'd get, you'd get something, but um, so yeah, don't put a rooftop solar thermal collector on, put all your, your eggs in the basket of the heat pump water heater. That's the less expensive, more efficient, it's both. It's less expensive and more efficient at the job. And that's exactly why you want to keep coming back to these Ask Sean shows is because he really has an eye on how to save money doing this. And so thank you, Sean, for really giving us those uh, that, that advice, which direction to go. Yes, thank you. Yeah, so uh, you're welcome. We just have uh, five minutes left. And so oh. if anybody has any final questions or if you, you know, think you might want to have a case study for next time, go ahead and pop that into the chat and, you know, first come, first serve, we can put you on the list. Yeah, I wanted to, can I, um, I go just ahead. wanted to ask Sean, Sean, you mentioned SMUD. Um, we are, you know, behind the orange curtain here in Orange County, always trying to get things moving. So Irvine has a building electrification um, you know, their city council is looking at that. And I was wondering if you had any just cities or programs or utilities that you think are doing some good things around that that we could take a look at? Oh, well, I think Silicon, Silicon Valley, Clean Energy, and SMUD are the two best, okay. in my humble opinion. And I apologize for all of the folks I've just upset. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I mean, Sonoma Clean Power is awesome. Rin Clean Energy. I, I get all of some cringing, thinking all of my friends being pissed at me. <laughs> but, okay, but Silicon Valley Clean Energy has been doing a fantastic job, as have SMUD, of doing contractor trainings. So, and they have videos, and they have they have formal programs to try to teach the contractors so that they'll stop opposing it, sort of reflexively out of their habit. Because for a long time, the state's been trying to stop electrification back when it meant all electric resistance, which made sense. But now that we have heat pumps, it's good to put in electric devices, but the contractors, some of them are a little like, what? What happened? Feeling whiplash. So um, Silicon Valley Clean Energy and SMUD have both done training programs. Both of them have put additional and the largest amounts of money into electrification contractors and have become sort of the sterling examples of what to do. Um, Silicon Valley Clean Energy with Tom Cabot here and Josie Gaylord, they advocated wisely to say, don't incentivize 200 amp panels because almost all 100 amp panels can do it. Um, down here is an example of a Tom and Josie and Redwood Energy collaboration 
um, this, where we're trying to show how a 100 amp panel can meet a 3,000 square foot home using like these little power balancing. They're, they're 240 volt plug strips. And you can plug two high power devices into one outlet and therefore get all of the services of high power things on a huge house. You just need to have a couple of these $500 plug strips. And so the, the point is Silicon Valley Clean Energy, they incentivize 100 amp upgrades like from 60 to 100 with bunches of money and just a little bit of money to go up to 200 amp panels. Like they're smart about not encouraging huge amounts of infrastructure upgrades if you can do efficient appliances or a couple of 240 volt plug strips or like, you know, figure something out instead of triggering somewhere between like three and $15,000 for yourself for a service upgrade and almost an equal amount of money at the utility level that they don't charge you. That's what it means to get a, like a 200 amp service if you have 100 amp service now, it might cost total Ten to forty thousand dollars in a system that's going to get paid for you and the system and everybody, it's just like a lot of money. So that they were smartly constraining it. Um, cool. So yeah, that's an answer. Those two. Yeah. We've got a bunch of great examples. Thank and you. I only see one last possible question. Frank uh, shared that he had got a quote for a heat pump, space mm. heating. Uh, to tie into our forced hot air duct system for $28,000 for our 2,500 square foot San Francisco old house. Is that a typical range? Yeah, let's look at and this. And we're going to wrap it up. Okay, this is the last one. So I, I paid for this data. Energy Smart Ohio did their nine houses that they'd electrified. And you said your house is like 2,500 square feet, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, so here you have three examples of homes about that size. And this relatively low cost, admittedly, like that, I was told that by Nate, it's like, yeah, he's kind of my guy. So, you know, it's kind of low cost. He's charging about $12,000 for homes your size for that exact system. So at $28,000, you're not only paying a Bay Area premium, but you're also paying a lack of, of bid competition. You should go right. get two, two more bids. And when you're doing that, try to grab the language from the first bid, not the price. Don't bid shop it unless you want to, but uh -huh. the other two, the language and say, I, I want to get an apples to apples bid. And they're going to probably respond by saying, I will not bid you an apple for apple. I'll bid you an apple for a pair because they'll want to substitute their heat pump or they might see other things that get, need to get done in the project that the other person didn't. But if you get three, you can more or less get what you need is the low Lower, lower cost person who's still going to get a quality bid. And the HVAC system, since it's the most expensive by three or four fold than anything else you're going to do, is the most important place to go to the tedious effort of getting a couple more bids. Right. And definitely reach out to the switcheson.org. There's a lot of good contractors there. Um, Diana, what was the name of what was the home doctors that we had on you had on a program before? Right, they're called the uh, the building doctors. Building doctors. In fact, I had someone come out and do uh, a home eval uh, for me this past week. I get the re report next week, so maybe there's some information there we can share next time. Just because um, I'm yeah. I'm one of those older houses and I have a ton of work to do to catch up. So the, thank just you. That, the, the building doctors. Dan Thompson owns that, and he's on the board of that organization for Smud with me. And I respect him hugely in part because he has the most beautiful bids. And you see every single item, every, every item has its price, which is so unique and fair. Now, he is not the least expensive because he's a doctor. Come on now. I mean, I think he's got a doctor, but that's, that's, he's a white gloves person. He's going into homes all over Los Angeles. So he comes in with that. You know, he's not the least expensive but he is the highest quality. So if you can afford the little bump up for quality, absolutely, it's not the kind of thing you'll regret because quality really shows forever and ever. Um, but I'm not, yeah, anyway, I, I adore him. I think he's a great person to partner with. That's, yeah, that's great. And they are local here in the Southern California. So uh, yeah, if anybody wants to know, uh, I'll, I'll pop their information into the chat really quick. Yeah, that'd be great. Well, I think this was a great show. I did want to share that um, you may want to look into the solar tax. 
um, that is going around. I don't know if Sean, you can speak to it, but um, it was um, not passed at the at our you know state level, but then the utilities went to the Cal California Public Utilities Commission and are, are trying to get a tax put on all people who are, have solar panels, including churches, schools, other buildings, homeowners. And so I would really recommend that you learn more about it. And I'm putting in the chat a place where you can comment directly to the California Public Utilities Commission. Um, Thank because you. It's definitely going to be you know, slowing the rollout of, of solar. And I think changing you know, what a lot of solar owners you know, were expecting to have happen and also changing the net metering. And he, here's a little guide that tells you a little bit more about it, but I think it's one of the big issues that is, you know, could impact, you know, and is re relevant to what we're talking about here in terms of electrification. So if anybody else wants to add to that, please, by all means, because it's really an important issue. And I think the more of us that can stand up for it and say, we don't want this tax, we don't need it. I think it will hopefully um, stop this from passing. Great, Tristan. Thank you so much. And thanks, everyone. Thank you, Sean. This was terrific. I love each of these shows is going to be different, right? Just because everybody's questions are going to be different. And uh, you'll probably be able to come back several times and learn, keep learning. So we're all sort of on the same journey here to learn together. Right. And, and please come back again. You know, if you're like, I went away, I started to get bids, but if there's still some confusing things that I need you know to clarify we want you to come back because we want to make sure that you know knowledge is power right especially right. when it comes to electrification and uh pardon the pun but i think it's right. applies here and share share about this so let's build a buzz and we'll have we'll have a an easy social media to share um so that and we'll diane and tristan and i we can we can get that out so we Great. That's great, Linda. And also, if you forget the date, which is August 15th, it's the third Monday. The yes. third Monday of every month is what we're targeting, 5.30 to 6.30 like this. So thank you, everybody, for chiming in. And, and I think, uh, Sean, thank yeah. you so much. And Sean, I think this is a great idea. Let's talk about outdoor entertaining at the next show. Next Yay. show. Because we're summertime. still in summer, and we will, you know, summer is almost all the time in California, so. For, Perfect. Uh, for that, I really think like summertime brownouts, outside parties, ways that yes. we can do like I want to show how to do weddings at the beach with all renewable energy, that kind oh, of that's stuff. Yes. That's I want to renew my vows, so let's tell yeah. me how to do that at the beach. Okay. Thank, thank well, you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you so great time. Time. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Great to see you. Bye, everyone. Oh, wait, Linda, did Linda, you, you didn't get a picture. But if you know from the video, we can get one, right? <laughs> yes. Uh, we didn't get a picture. We. That's all right. Next time. We'll, next right, time, guys. Yeah. Thanks a lot, everybody. Bye Thank bye. you, um, Diane. I did want to ask: Should we? Let's let's. Um, do you want me to make a, something to put out on social media? Um, let's do yeah. it early. We were just using that the one that uh, Tristan. Put together exactly. with the light bulb. We've been using that with the with the date. So if there's something else you want to use, uh, no, that's that's good. I'll I'll do it. I'll put out a tweet and copy you again. Then you can forward it, and then we'll. Um, I miss yeah. miss Facebook this month. It's kind of last minute, but we had our meeting last every night. Day, I know every month. Happened. So there you go. So okay. no, we have a, a social media person who will pick up on that. And if you just include us in the tag. We'll, you know, we'll just bounce it yeah. all back. I'll re I'll forward it to you too, Linda, with okay. the graphic and everything and the new link, just so that you've got it all since we're switching to a new one in August. Great. Oh, great. great. Thanks, that sounds guys. good. Thank okay, you. take care, you guys. Bye. 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 Bye.